All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin. It is very early for me, but for my guest today, it is actually in the afternoon, which is wonderful. Before we bring him on the show, just a quick note for those of you who have sent in comments about my new album. Thank you guys very much. Uh, the Forgotten Puppet Show is show slowly releasing onto the different platforms. So keep a look on the website, scotthaskin.com, and you will see when that comes out. Now, you guys may know my guest from Trapeze. You may know him from Uriah Heep, but you should really get to know him from his new album, Easy with the Heartaches. Here he is, Peter Golby. Peter, how are you? Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. I am so glad that you put this album out. I've listened to it a few times. So am I. Enjoying every song from beginning to end. How does it feel after all this time to finally let these songs out into the world? <laughs> It feels really strange, Scott. It makes me, it feels as though I've been away for, I think it's 32 years since I stopped completely. I was, uh, the only way that I could do it is to be in denial and pretend that I was never anything to do with the music business. And it feels like I've been up in the sky in a spaceship and I've come back and nothing's changed. Well, we're very glad to have you back. Thank you. Did you during that interim time? Did you listen to your work with Trapeze or with Uriah Heep? Did you ever put those records on? No. Wow. No. It, the best. It was the only way I could walk away was to walk away completely. Mm -hmm. You know, I think 1992 was the when I walked away, and uh, as I say, haven't listened to anything. Haven't been to see any bands. I've lost touch with. Anybody that was in the music business I lost touch with, um, it was just the way, that was the way I, I had to do it. I think that's understandable, though, because otherwise, you know, you have to start questioning your decisions. You have to maybe yeah. potentially live with regret. Uh, since you've now put this album and felt that, that reconnection that you've come back down to earth with us, do, have you started to listen back to that stuff? Yes. How does it feel? It's absolutely... It's really strange because when I was singing, I, w I was always uncomfortable listening to my work. But because it's been such a long time, now I can listen to it as though it's not me, it's someone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to this guy singing, and I'm thinking, wow, he's good. <laughs> and I'm listening to, I'm li seriously, I'm listening to phrasing. And I'm thinking, that's really good. That's really good. I mean, there are things that you think, well, uh, I changed that slightly. Because bear in mind, these songs were only demos. When I was with Heap, I'd spend the whole afternoon doing one vocal. Right. Trying it this way, trying it that way. The songs on my new album, or new old album, or old new album, um, the vocals were done very quickly, probably an hour or an hour and a half per song. Wow. I mean, the whole thing, what we, what we used to do, uh, there was me and my bestest pal, Paul Hodson, who, who did all the keyboards, all the arranging, all the programming. <clears throat> We'd do three songs at a time. So I was signed to Rondor Music as a writer. And when I got three songs together, I'd phone Paul, we'd book the studio, and we'd go in. And we'd do three, it would take us three days to complete three songs. That's from start to finish, with the vocals, with everything done. And those songs that you're listening to, the only people involved was me and my pal, Paul Hodson. And then when the songs were complete and I'd done the vocals and we got close to a good, ready to mix the song, um, <clears throat> In the other studio, um, Eddie, who played the solos for me, I would give him 20 quid and say, Eddie, would you put a guitar solo on this song? <laughs> and that's the way it was. That's exactly the way it was. There was no pressure. And I think the reason why the, the, the album is so strong is because there was no pressure. Yeah. Um, and it was written over probably, in reality, over probably a three to four year period. Um, there were a lot more songs, but I've ch I, I selected the songs for this album um, because 
I wanted it to be punchy. I didn't want it to be too soft because people are used to m me singing with heap. Um, and I didn't want them to be disappointed. But I, I just naturally write commercial songs. Mm -hmm. that, that's the way I do it. I'm not, a, I'm not a guitarist, so it's not heavy, heavy guitar influenced. M my, uh, my strength is obviously my voice and melodies. That, that's, what, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I have to say that the album, the sound of the album is fantastic. I mean, it was recorded in the late 80s, but it sounds like it could have been done yesterday. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I think part of that is because it's not cluttered. Yeah. It's very tempting when you've got a big budget and, and, you, and you're in a posh studio to just keep doing more overdubs and spend more and more time and more and more money on songs. And, they, and then they tend to get cluttered and mishy-mushy, uh, which brings me to Equator. And I think that's when we did Equator, that was, that was part of the problem. I still believe in the songs on Equator. If you strip it down and take away all the overdubs and all the reverb, I mean, the whole thing was just swamped in reverb. Um, if you take all that away, some people listen to Equator and think it's great. And I, I've, I think I've figured out why. If you listen to it on, say, your phone or on s small speakers or s something, something like that, you don't get all the, the mushiness of it. You just g g get the song. You, you know, you can't hear all, all the overdubs. Right. But if you put it on decent-sized speakers, there's that much going on. I'm thinking, God, it's difficult to listen to it. It isn't that it's a bad album. It's, it's, it sounds bad, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and when, I, when I covered those seasons, because uh, every, every album is a season on the podcast, uh, that was the only complaint that I really had. It was never the writing, mm -hmm. never the performances. It was the, the audio production of the albums. The, the yeah, not, diffi not just all difficult. The yeah. Yeah, difficult. And I mean, there's been all sorts of stories that that actually isn't the final mix. Apparently, I, I, someone told me that the actual final mix of Equator was actually lost. Wow. And so, um, so what happened was they did a quick job of a quick, quick, you know, remixing it or something. I don't know exactly what went on, but, you know, for sure the actual sound quality isn't very good. I mean, the amount of, if you think, I won't give you any figures, but if, if you imagine the cost of Equator and the cost of my album, it's laughable. Oh, sure. You know? and, and yet my, my album sounds clearer because there's not much on it. That does help. But also the instruments are panned so that you can, everything gets a chance to be heard. Yes. That makes a big difference. And, and if I recall an equator, that was my biggest complaint, is that everything seemed to be in the center. Thank you. Do you know why? Because it was mono. Mm. I can remember uh, our then manager coming into the studio. We, we, were, we were nearly finished. And uh, he came into the control room, and we were playing the album. And he said, it sounds like it's in mono. Mm. And it was. Because Tony, who was producing, rightly or wrongly, Tony wanted to produce us so it sounded like we were, would sound when we play live. Mm. Whether that's right or whether that's wrong, whether it's good or bad, I, don't, I can't really comment. But that was done on purpose. And like you say, it's the stereo mix and where you place things. I don't know much about recording. I'm a, I was a singer. That's what I did. Sure. But... If you listen to my stuff, I, I listened to my new album with earphones for the first time. And, and, and that was about two weeks ago. And um, the only time I do, lis uh, do listen to music is when I'm on holiday, uh, sitting on the beach. And I always listen to it through earphones. And I listen to people like Brian Adams, for instance or Bon Jovi, or, or, or whoever it is. And the placement of the instruments is all around your head. And you think, wow, listen to just listen. To, it's fantastic. And I never realized my, my album 
It's got the same sound. You know, the, the things are spread out. Not that there's that many of much stuff going on anyway, mm -hmm. but I, I think there were so many things against Equator. Yeah. And that's why it failed. There, there were so many things. And, and apart from anything else, I'd, st I'd still like to know why we didn't use Ashley Howe, because <laughs> it just made perfect sense. We'd done two successful albums, mm -hmm. Bomb and Ogden Head First. And then I, I can't remember where I was, but it was just suddenly, an out well, Ashley's not doing this record. Mm -hmm. And it was like, what? Why are we not used in Ashley? Right. So to me, that was a massive mistake. Mass massive mistake. Sure. Well, when you have something that works, why change it? Thank you. <laughs> exactly. So by, so by baking a cake, if you bake the cake once a week for the last 30 years, why change the recipe? Exactly. What's the point? Yeah. I think I'll just add more salt to this. No. The cake is fine. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And, and I think the phrase that I uttered most during that season, especially uh, for Equator, was I really wish I had a better mix of this uh, this song to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as I say, some people really like it. And I mm -hmm. think the re if you could talk to each and every one of them, they'd probably say, yeah, well, I'll listen to it on my, my little phone or I'll listen to it, you know, in the car or, or something like that. It, it was just too complicated. It was too complicated. Whereas my my new album is completely the opposite. Completely mm -hmm. the opposite. Well, and, and I and you know, it sounds though like there is a lot going on in your album, even though there really isn't. Just that blend of synth and guitar really makes the album sound huge. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Well, the thing is, going back to the bake and the cake, you know, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have five people making a cake. You'd have one person making a cake, Very or and, and, and maybe the kid, you know, mixing up the mixture with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think my my album sticks together really well, so, song by song, is because I was so I'm so into it because it's part of me. And like all, I, I did all the power chords, I did all the uh, jingly jangly Brian Adams type arpeggio stuff mm -hmm. and as i say uh we just got eddie morton 20 pounds a time to put a couple of solos on and that was it um but but also i've i've said this over the last few weeks to people when i left the band with mickey and the boys when i left the band it's almost as though there was no rush for me to dive into and finish the song you know get it ready for the next day or, or whatever I took my time and thought about it, uh, uh, and and because this, those, those are the best songs over a three, uh, I think it was a three-year period, and so they're going to be strong songs. You know, you can't write really good songs all the time. No one can. Sure. It's gonna, there's going to be some songs that stick out. And there is going to be some songs that you think, well, that's not going to make it, or that could be used as a B-side mm -hmm. or a, an album filler or something like that. But I had the luxury of writing that, those songs, and they were all spread out. In fact, there's, there's more songs, but I chose to put the, 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 these so, certain songs together on the album because they're, they're pretty much... There's a thread, Scott. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. People have already p picked up on it. There's a thread going through the album. It sounds like an album. It doesn't sound like a bunch of songs. It, uh, to me, it sounds like it's, it's got a purpose. You know, there is a thread, and it, 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 a couple of people have said it sort of drags you in. Mm hmm it's very cohesive. That makes any sense. Yeah, it, it's very cohesive. It, it it really feels like it was specifically written to be an album. Yeah, but it wasn't. <laughs> that's that's what's interesting it, about it. Yeah, you know. I mean, that's sorry to interrupt. Um, so some of those songs were written for other artists. Mm -hmm. I wrote "Easy with the Heartaches." That's the opening track, and the last track on the album is called "The Last Time." Both of those songs I wrote for Tina Turner. Now, if you if you stop and think, 
And imagine me not singing easy with the heartaches and imagining Tina Turner singing that song. It would have worked perfectly for her. Lyrically, the whole the whole thing, the, the atmosphere. Yeah, I listened to an interview that you did recently with Trevor Hensley where you had mentioned that. So when I listened back to the album again last night, I did exactly that. I did that with with the the idea of Tina Turner singing both of those songs. And yeah, you're right. Did you ever end up pitching those to her? Good question. Well, I didn't. I was signed to Rondo Music, and I wrote the songs, and I said to the people at Rondo, would you send them to Tina Turner? Whether she ever got to listen to the songs, probably not. I don't know. I've, mm-hmm. I've no idea. But but that's that's how it was done. Um, but But they all seem to... They're all in a... There's no diversity. There's a, a definite track, you know, that they're all going down the set to me, that all, all the songs on the album, although they're different to each other, there is there's this, this track thread that goes through the whole thing. I am absolutely thrilled with it. I really am. I'm so excited. I was so just blown away when I heard that this album was coming out. I mean, for, for one, you had, like you said, you know, you had kind of left the planet. And so when I started the podcast and I was, you know, trying to reach out to all the members of the band to see if they wanted to come on the show, uh, I, the only thing I'd heard from you was that no one knew where you were. So when I saw the album come out, I was just elated that we were hearing something new from you and that you you were providing us with some more of your talent because I've always been a big fan of your voice. Thank uh, you. As I've done the the reviews of the songs, every one of them, I, I think I said, he just sounds so powerful. You know, without screaming, without hitting the, you know, really harsh low notes or anything to push it, you just have a powerful sound to your voice. Yeah. I think that um, the new album, I'm... I'm right there in my comfort zone vocally. Hmm. I, I, when we were doing the heap, the heap stuff, and not so much the trapeze stuff, but definitely the heap stuff, heap songs uh, and all the covers that we did, <clears throat> Ashley was a taskmaster. He would say, come on, you know, uh, and it, he would get the very, very, very best that I could perform. That's one thing that Ashley did uh, for me. Um, he, he taught me a lot. Um, but you never say never. That's my new catchphrase right now is never mm. say never. Ah. You, you know, you, 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 if you think you can't do it, the chances are that you probably can. Um, but um, on the new album, there are no what I would call big, big notes. Mm-hmm. You know, top D or something like that. You know, the, your, your Lou, Lou Graham area. Um, but... Um, it was it wasn't done consciously um i think it was because uh when i wrote the songs oh, in the back of my mind i was ho- hoping to get lots of covers so i didn't want how can i put this if me and mickey had have done this album together or me and mickey and the band it would have come out a lot heavier some of the songs we probably wouldn't have used because they're not heavy enough. But things like um, "They'll Never Find Us," which is one, of, which is actually my favourite song on the song on the album. Um, in fact, I'm trying to get Mickey to record it if he's if he's watching, if he's listening, oh. um, because it, it, we would have killed that. The heap line with me singing at that time would have absolutely killed that song. I could see that. I I could definitely see that. Uh, it's you know, yeah, it's, it's a little yeah. bit heavier of a song for, for the album That's in right. comparison. And yeah, well, I, I listen, think Mick would have been great. Yeah, if you listen to it, it's got the same parts as Blood Red Roses. It's got that big intro. Mm-hmm. It's got that big melody. Uh, and it's got the chorus. That um, they'll never they'll never find us is my, if you like, um, baby. We were born to run. Ah. Um, bon Jovi, uh, living on a prayer. Mm-hmm. Just, just you know, we're running away. They're never going to get us. And th- that that's the whole theme of that song. And I still say, 
that if he did it, it would be absolutely fantastic. They'd make an incredible job. When I wrote Blood Red Roses, I didn't actually record Blood Red Roses before I sent it. I sent Mick, <clears throat> the copy that I sent to Mick was me playing the, the chords. Mm -hmm. And then I'd play that back on one ghetto blaster in my bedroom. And then I'd play along with what I'd already recorded. And so what Mick got was very, very basic. But I, I could hear it in, I can always hear it in my head as though it's a finished thing. It might sound ridiculously stupid to put someone listening to it. They might think, that's, that's rubbish. That's shit. <laughs> well, you, but, no, but, but that's how we did it back if then. The, if, if, if it works with me sitting in the bedroom with a rockman and singing along to a few chords, if it works there, the only way is up. In other words, when you start getting a good bass, bass player and a drummer, a keyboard, it just then goes completely to a much, much higher level. Oh, absolutely. But as I say, I'll never find a Uriah Heep. You must record it. You must record it. Well, but, but, you know, thinking back to those days when I was a kid, too, before we had portable four-track recorders, I had two, yeah. you know, cassettes from Kmart. You record on one, yeah. you play that, you record on the other. That's how we multi-tracked back then. That's how that's we it. put that's our how ideas. I did it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's, what I, that's how I did Blood Red Roses. But as I say, um, the reason I keep it on about that, that they'll never find us is because if you, listen, if you strip the songs down, they are very... Although they sound nothing like each other, the, the components are all there in both songs. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a comparison between the two now. I love Blood Red yeah. Roses. I think it's a great song. I was so glad that you... I was so jealous, Scott. Yeah? Yeah, I was, I was so jealous because when, uh, when I heard it because I've, ne I've never done a version of it. and It wouldn't have been f very different to the way the boys did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um but to, to hear it completely finished, because the last time I heard it was me singing into a tape machine with, and bl blasting out my Rockman. That was that was the last I heard of the song. And then the next thing I see, it's it's, it's walking down the aisle with Mickey. <laughs> it's fantastic, <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I think they're both great songs, and I agree. I would love to hear Uriah Heep record it. One thing that uh, that I wanted to ask you about, um, you actually have something in common with Ian Gillen. Uh, Ian Gillen, uh, very early on in his career, now, of course, he's been singing for Deep Purple for the last, you know, most of his life. But uh, he was very heavily influenced by Dusty Springfield, as you were. He used to open for Dusty. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's really, that's really strange, because when Trevor asked me the question, and uh, before we even started the interview... And I said, well, I'll tell you something. Uh, I always tell the truth. I said, sometimes it gets me into trouble. I said, but I, I was brought up, I was told that if you tell the truth, everything will work out. I said, so whatever question you ask me, I will tell you the truth. And I think he nearly fell off the chair when, it, when I said what my favorite singer was Dusty Springfield. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dusty made such great music. And at the time, you know, if you think about what was going on in, in the music world oh, at the yeah. time, so innovative. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I watched, um, I discovered uh, Sky Arts, which is a, a, a program that's on in the UK. Uh, I only discovered it um, in the summer of this year. And they play, it's not just music, it's art. It could be pa paint, landscape painting, it could be pottery, it could be sculpture, it could be anything. But um, every day in the afternoon, we've got 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, music on absolutely fantastic and dusty was on about three days ago and my wife said your girl's on your girl's on <laughs> <laughs> it, i just love it not so much the the early stuff but the the, the what we all call and know as the powerhouse stuff you know mm -hmm. yeah i only want to be yeah. with you and all and and, and the, some of the songs are just dynamite absolutely dynamite songs clever so clever very clever. Especially that song, I Only Want to Be With You, when I think about that recording, you know, here's one thing that I can I can compare that to you as well, and, and a handful of other singers, is that I really feel the passion of that coming through. When you're singing and you're talking about, you know, let's run away from this and, and just, you know, we're going to be okay. I feel mm -hmm. that. You know, there's so many people that just sort of read the lyrics and I don't feel that they're in the story. 
but I've always felt that with you with Dusty. Well, there's a big difference there. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that, that I just obviously just do naturally. Mm-hmm. I can remember working with um, early Roth, you know, guitar player early John Roth. Mm-hmm. I did a thing with him, and and he 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 got me down to his house, and um, he'd been asking me and asking me to do this symphonic rock for Europe. And I kept saying no. And then he, he he sent me two or three, I think he sent me two songs. And and they were really good, really good. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it for you. And um, it was me and John Parr. And we went down to uh, Uli's house. Uh, uh, I actually met Monica, you know, Monica Danneman, mm-hmm. Jimi Hendrix's girlfriend. Yeah. Because she, she was living with Uli. And she cooked me a meal. There you go, my claim to fame. <laughs> she cooked me a meal. And and anyway, so we we were running through the, some of the songs with Uli, John Parr and myself, stood next to the piano. And and Uli was looking at me and he just put his head on one side and he said, you know, he said, you do the strangest thing. Some of your phrasing, he said, he's just, he said, you probably don't even know you're doing it, do you? I said, doing what? <laughs> He said, "You don't know, then, do you?" He said, "You, you, 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 do, you got this way. It's just the way that I, I don't know. If I knew what it was, I, I could explain it a lot easier. But um, yes, uh, I, nat- I naturally do things um, not on purpose. It just, it's just the way that it happens. Well, it's just the way that you feel the music. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's a very quick story. Um, when I was th- when I was 60 years old, my mother and I got into a bit of an argument. It was a bit of an ar- a family argument, and over the years, a few people have said to me, especially one of my cousins, a female cousin, um, <clears throat> and she she used to say, "I know the Golby secrets," and Uh-oh. I've never understood. I never understood what she meant. Anyway, cut a long story short. You might know this. You might not know this. Um, <clears throat> when I was 60 years old, my mother confessed that my father wasn't actually my father. Oh, wow. Which was, can you imagine that? It knocked me on the floor. It, yeah. I, it killed me. Yeah. But do you know what's weird? Do you know what's weird? No. My real father, who was supposed to be... Um, the guy that I thought was my father's friend. (laughs) So this is what goes on in life. Anyway, cut a long story short, my real father was a singer. Wow. Isn't that weird? Must have just been in the genes, huh? It's really strange, and and I've, I've said that from that day to this. Had I known that all along, my life might have might have taken a different course. In other words, I might not have stopped singing. Yeah. Because it all makes sense. Mm-hmm. He was a singer and he played the piano professionally. Wow. Isn't that strange? You know, there are just so many moments, it seems, in life that one decision could change the course of everything. Yeah. You know, and you had mentioned in your in your interview with Trevor that had Facebook been around in the eighties that you might yeah. not have stopped singing because you didn't know how much people appreciated what you did. 100%. On, on, I've just put my hand on the heart. Seriously. Peter, that breaks my heart. <laughs> if, if I, if I'd have known people were really behind me, I, I wouldn't have stopped. And, and, and again, knowing why I was born to sing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pivotal moment, pivotal moment. Sure. But you guys back in those days, you guys were untouchable. I couldn't just, you know, call somebody up and say, hey, I'd like to get an interview with Peter. Oh, OK. I mean, unless you were in a national magazine, that wasn't going to happen. People couldn't really reach you guys to tell you the way that we can now. I think that's sad no. that artists don't. Uh, and even now, a lot of people won't take the yeah. time to tell you they'll complain. They'll tell you what's wrong, but they won't take the time to tell you this song really touched my heart. You know, exactly. It's it's sad. Yeah, over the years, because <clears throat> some of my songs got boot, 
That's another thing with my album. It's been bootlegged twice. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was quick. Honestly, that's part of the reason why I agreed to do all this, because when we lost Trevor, uh, and then we lost Lee, and <clears throat> then we lost Ken, then John Lawton, this is all part of all part and parcel of the package that made me say, look, <clears throat> when I go, some bugger is going to bootleg it again. And so I thought, well, why don't I say yes now and we'll get it out and we'll get it set. We'll, you know, remaster it digi digi digitally. I can't even say digitally. It's a tough one. Um, yeah. Make it sound posh. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's part of the reason why I'm sat here today talking to you is because if we're going to do it, let's get it out and make it as good as we can possibly get it to sound. Yeah. Now, were you able over the, the course of the 32 years, were you able to just forget that you did this or every once in a while did it kind of creep in your head and go, I really wish I would do something with this? Um, it's very weird um, because it's great. It's been great fun in a lot of ways because a lot of people that I have known over the, since I've stopped, since I stopped singing, uh, I'm not the kind of person that stands leaning against the bar and says, do you know who I am? Or do you know who I used to be? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't, that's not me. I don't say anything. And there are people today still finding out that you never told me you were a singer. <laughs> and it's just so funny, a lot, a, a, especially a lot of um, my wife's friends, and you know, because we've got horses and we, we mix with horsey people. Um, and they're absolutely blown away, and especially now with the album coming out, mm -hmm. and, and neighbors and people like that. I mean, only the, I think I said this with Trevor uh, about a week or so ago. I was walking the dogs down the lane, and my neighbor pulled up in the car next to me, and and, and she said, your album is fantastic. Uh... <laughs> and, I said, and I said, what a start to the day. Mm -hmm. what a what what a fantastic thing for somebody to say to you yeah. you know but um it's it's all uh, it's all a bit overwhelming for me to tell you the truth oh uh, I'm sure i love it, it. Is. yeah I, I absolutely love it and uh, i'm so thrilled i'm more than anything i'm very very proud and sometimes um i, I, I go on to youtube and as i say there's some bootleg some of those tunes are up there that were bootlegged. Um, and some of the comments that people make, it brings tears to my eyes because they really get it. Right. You know, I can remember, you know, with, with certain songs and you think when I, when I was writing this song and that song and they'll say, oh, it's, it, it reminds me of Thin Lizzy or it reminds... And I think that's why... That's, that's what... That's what I was thinking when I was writing it. <laughs> and yeah. they get it. Right. They get it. It's 30 years on. And yet there are people that never saw me sing at all because they're probably, you know, five years old at the time. Right. Um, and they're listening to me uh, and, and songs that, that, that I've written. And they totally get it. And, and I think, how oh, incredible. And that, that's part and parcel of the reason why I said to you, had we got the internet and people were, were, were able to communicate directly or indirectly to the artists, I think a lot of people would have been a lot happier in doing, you know, continuing doing what they were doing. Sometimes you feel as though you're banging your head against the wall, yeah. you know, because especially when it's, we were so busy, we were so busy all the time. Um, we were very successful. Everybody wanted us to go and play in this country and that country. And as I said, you know, many times, I've, I've, I think I've filled, I think I've filled three passports in four years, five years. There was no, there was no space to put any more country stamps in there. And, and Mick is still doing it. He is, yeah. I, I, I'd love to know the, the total amount of passports that Mick has used. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and the touring schedule that you guys had was absolutely ridiculous. I, and that was a thing in that time, in the 70s and the 80s, so many bands, if you were successful, you were going to be overworked to death. Yeah. You know, I, I look at Purple 
and and think about you know how many times did I hear John Lord say if they just would have let us take a month off or three months or six months off the Mark II yeah. lineup would have stayed together for a long time yeah. but they pushed and pushed I used and pushed. to say I used to have those conversations with Mick mm-hmm. you know why don't we just do a bit less you know that it just killed me in the end it killed me you know um, my voice didn't give up my voice never gave up um, but mentally. I think I'm probably, I was the person that invented mental health. I was thinking about it the other day. Wow. I think I picked it up in some foreign country and brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, honestly, because at, the, at that time, if you say mental health, did people just look at you? No, it's, a, it's all day long. That's all you hear is mental health. And we're, we're all under so much stress and strain. Well, I was under all of that. You know, from 1982 to 85, it was, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And that, that was all part and parcel of the, you know, the, the mouse on the wheel. I remember we did, we did India. We, I mean, there's so many memories and people say to me, you should write a book. Yeah. And I think yeah. maybe I should, maybe I should. Um, but, but in the end, I was just completely burnt out, completely yeah. mentally. And then the, fi- the final straw really was uh, Equator. I was so heartbroken. I was so disappointed, you know, n- not in the, the, the sound and so much of the record, but we, we, got, we, we had no support whatsoever. We arrived in Australia and I was met off the plane by three representatives from CBS Records. And I can remember... As we came down, it was like the Beatles getting off an aeroplane, and there were these three three guys from CBS, and they handed us all a little present each, and I thought, it's a watch. They've given me a watch. It was a, it was a bloody pen knife. <laughs> what? That's a random pen, a, gift. Ni- a, a, a knife, a folding knife. <laughs> what, what were you supposed to do they with that? They probably thought we were going get to stuck, get stuck in the outback and it'd probably save our lives. <laughs> well, but yeah. We, 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 we were in Australia, and they didn't even know the equator was out. And that's uh, our record company. Oh, uh, yeah. And it, Mick and I looked at each other and it was like, what are we doing? And uh, as I say, then we did 36 days, 36 shows in 42 days. And on the four days that I had to take off because I did lose, I'd got laryngitis. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot of thinking and I thought, I can't keep doing this. But going full circle, we did very often talk. I did very often talk to Mickey and say, "Well, why don't we just tour for six months <laughs> and and have some time off?" But we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it because it, financially we couldn't do it. Yeah, it was it was that mach- it, that machine, Scott. You know, there were fifteen people I think at one point. There's five people in the band and ten people road crew, and every day that you were out there and you weren't playing. It was costing lots of money, keeping people in a hotel doing nothing. Sure. And so that's the rock and roll machine. And so we have to keep doing more and more and more. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, all I've touched on really is all the negative side of it. But there were some fantastic positive sides to it as well. You know, we had a great time. We were treated fantastically well, Um, you know, some of the some of the gigs that we did were just incredible. I can remember. Um, I've got. Um, I say I. It's not me. Some kind people started a Facebook page. You know, my Pete Golby uh, Facebook page a couple of years ago, and um, there's there's some great pictures on there. And somebody a, 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 a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago. Um, Put on. Actually, it's Kevin Julie in Canada. Kevin Ju- Julie has stuck with me all this all this time, and he's he's trying to persuade me to come back, come back. And anyway, I'm finally back. Um, but he he posted a picture of me and Mickey doing the Texas Jam. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether you're a, 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 a aware of that gig. Oh, yeah. It happens every year mm-hmm. in 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 Dallas and Houston. Uh, and I think I, I think it was. I don't know whether my dates are correct, but it's. I think 81, I did it with trapeze, and 82, or 82 and 83. So I did trapeze, and then a year later, I did it with Uriah Heap. 
and it was 60,000 people. And I saw the picture the, a few weeks ago, and I thought, shit, look at the size of the crowd. <laughs> and I'd completely forgotten it, because as I say, when I walked away, I, I almost killed Pete Golby. I, I, I almost killed, you know, I had to put him to sleep. That was that was the way of dealing with it. Is pretending he never existed, but looking at some of the stuff now, you think, "Wow!" I was watching Sky Arts and uh, going back to the television. Sky Arts a few weeks ago, watching the Eagles live, and I said to Lynn, my wife, I said, "Look at the size of that crowd. There must have been fifteen, twenty thousand people there." And then the commercial break came on, and it was the LA Forum, and we did it twice. Wow. Was it, was I didn't there, even realize I'd done that. Did, did it ever matter to you when you walked on stage to see a, a 15,000 crowd or a 60,000 crowd? Did it make no, a difference for you? It, never, never, never entered my head. Mm-hmm. We were just doing what we did, yeah. whether it was 500 um, people or 50,000. You know, we did um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the very first gigs that I did was Castle Donington. You know, the, oh, yeah. The, and that was the beginning of it all for us. We 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 did great, you know. It was raining. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was raining. I think we were second on. Uh, I think Anvil, a Canadian band, were on first. Then us. I think Status Quo, uh, Hawkwind. I can't remember. I think Status Quo were headlining, and I, I can always remember. Uh, we we went on, and did the Wizard. And I think that changed everything because all, all the bands want to come on and blow the place apart. And we didn't try and do that. We, we, we tried to set, set ourselves aside from that. And I, I can always remember um, it was just, that was the start. And within, within two or three weeks of us doing Castle Donington, every, every country in Europe wanted us to go and play there. Yeah. It was just great. Sure. Incredible. Did some incredible gigs, incredible gigs. Well, I'm glad that you have retained those memories, and I hope that it, and, and I, I, I hate this word, so please forgive me for not finding a better word, Peter. But do you feel, after all of this now, putting this album out, seeing what people have to say about it and, and you, do you feel validated now from what you didn't get before in the 80s? Yes. Yes, I, I do. And my wife said exactly the same to me. She said, you're a happy man now. Hmm. And I am. I'm. I'm just so happy now. Um, it makes you. Th- I'm just not speaking because because I'm trying to think at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's it it it's just mind-boggling to think what would have been. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. If I, uh, I don't regret anything. Mm-hmm. I don't regret b- doing it. I don't regret stop regret stopping doing it. And I don't regret putting the album out now uh, for everybody to see. But as I say, if, if I'd been away in a spaceship and I'd come back and nothing's changed, what would it, where would we have gone? Right. Where, where would it have gone? You know, mm-hmm. it, it would be amazing to be, to be able to look at, into a crystal ball and say, well, you know, um, it didn't end. It certainly didn't end at all for Mickey and the boys after I went. You know, it's, the, the band is still fantastic, absolutely yeah. fantastic. I don't know how Mickey does it. I don't know how he does it, but he's, he's whatever he's on, tell him to send me some. <laughs> uh, because it must be so taxing, you know. Uh, it's hard work. And it was, it was hard work when I was in my 30s, you know, and Mickey... Mickey's got to be the same age as me. I, I don't know, maybe a year behind or maybe a year in front. And to be, be still doing it and doing it so well, it must be absolutely fantastic. God bless him. God yeah, bless him. I, I agree. And, he, he, you know, the first time that I saw Heap Live was uh, a, a couple of years before the pandemic. And uh, you could not, the whole show, you couldn't slap the smile off of his face. He just loves being there. Yeah. Yeah, we used... We used to have a ball. I mean, we were doing all the festivals, uh, as the boys are still doing, and it was absolutely great. And there was like a circuit uh, 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 that everybody did, and it would be um, Motorhead, 
Ian Gillen band, not with the Purple, when mm-hmm. he was on his own. Um, Gary Moore, uh, girls' school. I can't remember. A whole bunch of us. And you'd find that nearly every weekend we'd, we'd all be on the same bill, but in a different country, right. you know, doing festivals. And the, ta- the times, I can't tell you, that w- w- we were always headlining. Which you were, I, Can you imagine me? I come from Trapeze, and then suddenly, although Trapeze were a great band, um, not wasn't a headline band. Um, so for me to suddenly be thinking, well, we're not on till half past ten tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we, and we're there at two o'clock in the afternoon. You think, well, what are we going to do till half past ten tonight? Uh, but the point I'm going to get to in a minute is, I think we caused so many internal arguments with all those other bands because we used to blow the place apart. Mm-hmm. No matter who was on and how, how well they'd done, we would come on and, you see, we would win, it was always a win-win-win situation because we got that catalogue of songs. Right. You know, we got Easy Living, we got The Wizard. It, 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 just so many songs to look, to, 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 to look, you know, from the history. And then we, we've also got the Abominog songs as well and the Head First songs. And we would, you know, I can say this honest, honestly, and I don't want to upset anyone, but we used to blow it. Wherever we went, they knew we'd been. Mm. You know, we would, we would always grab the headlines because it was such a solid band. And it still is. It's, it, it hasn't really changed. Mm-hmm. It's just great songs. It's all, to, it's, it's down to the, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's down to the music. And as I, I've said, since doing some interviews with various people over the last couple of weeks, you know, I really, really loved the music, but I hated the music business. Well, that's it for a lot of people, you know, uh, and I think that yeah. there's a certain amount of disillusionment from fans that think that, you know, it's a glamorous rock and roll lifestyle. You might play for no, two hours, <laughs> but you've got 22 hours to fill before your yeah. next gig, you know, in a city that you don't live in, where you don't know your way around. Uh, there's so much more to it. It's like an actor. You know, people think about the time that they're actually acting and filming. But there's, you know, for every five minutes that you're acting, you're probably 45 minutes sitting around waiting for the, yeah. the thing to be reset. It's it, The yeah. entertainment business is not as glamorous as we make it out to be. No. I can, I can remember being in, in Australia and we did a Hells Angels. Uh, it was a biker convention. Mm-hmm. And you know what time? It, it was a festival. And it had been going on, um, on I think it was the, the Saturday and the Sunday. And we were on on the Sunday night. Well, we thought we were on on Sunday night. We were actually on on Monday morning. We were on at half past four in the oh, a.m. Wow. <laughs> Honestly, you ask Mickey uh, if, if he remembers that gig. I, I can't... I, I, I can't remember where it was, but it was it was Australia, and it was a biker. The hell, it was the Hell's Angels annual get together, and we were we weren't on till something like half past four in the morning. But they were still awake. I thought everybody everybody be lying on the floor asleep, but they weren't. It was it was just incredible. Well, I mean, even even if they had been, I have a feeling that when you guys took the stage, you would have just woken them all up. Well, uh, yeah. Poss- yeah, m- maybe they were, and maybe they did get up. No, but as I say, I've got some incredible memories. Incredible memories. Well, here's what I would encourage you to do, and totally up to you. Just, just my intruding uh, suggestion: grab a notebook, and just any time you think of one of those stories, just jot a few notes down about it, and then just take a look at it. And if you decide that you know, I think I would enjoy writing a book, do it. Well, Bob did one. Yeah, Bob Daisley. Yeah, just recently. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read it. I haven't had the chance to either. Uh, but I don't even I don't even know whether I'm, I'm I might not be in the book. You never know. But you might. Yeah, but <laughs> but I mean, Bob. But just just as I say, I can think of each member in separately in turn and just think of so many stories. Bob, Bob was great, very talented, great guy. Uh, Lee, fantastic drummer, absolutely oh, yeah. fantastic drummer. John. 
Sinclair, not only is he one of the best keyboard players on the planet, he's, he's, he is the funniest man on the planet. Really? He made me laugh so much. It's John Sinclair. Oh, that's awesome. I love him. Well, I, I, love I could talk to you for hours, Peter. I have no doubt of that. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Uh, otherwise, I would love to just keep going. But I want to thank you, uh, not only no for problem. taking time to talk to me, a stranger that you don't know on the other side of the world, but for putting this album out, for giving us a chance to hear these songs. Everybody who's listening to this show, I highly recommend listening to this album. I've got the links in the show notes where you can purchase it. I've also got a link to the Facebook group in there that Peter was talking about. Um, I, I'm so glad to see you, to know that you're okay, and to hear your voice on these amazing songs. It's it's a fantastic album. I will enjoy this over and over. I promise you that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Will you take care of yourself anytime you, I will. Uh, you want? You are welcome back here yeah. any day. Well, you know, I'll just say one thing. Mm -hmm. What this has done for me is proved to me that I was right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. With, with the music... With the album coming out and the reaction that we're getting, it, it makes me feel so proud. And I know that I was right. I was listening to, the, you know, listening to the songs. You know, I, any one of those songs, to me, any one of those songs on the album stands up so well. And, and thinking that they're 32 years old. Well, that's that's the thing. It's like I said, it, it sounds like it could have been recorded recently just with some 80 synthesizers. Yeah. You know, it, it has that quality to it. But no, I, I'm very glad to hear that you're that you're happy that you put the effort in and did this. Uh, I also love the autograph card that I got with my CD. That was a nice touch. Thank you. Yeah, we did. I was asked to. Do, I, I spent I'm looking out of my window now. I'm looking at a horse, actually. It's about 15 feet away from me from my window. But this is this is a bench. And I can remember sitting on the bench uh, a few months ago, and I, I signed 500 CDs, so the first 500 CDs uh, would have been autographed. Oh, that's yeah, that's awesome, and I'm sure I'm sure that was a bit of a chore after about the first 20. No, I, I was excited at the time. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much. I wish you the absolute best. I cannot thank you enough for this wonderful album. Uh, I, I'm really glad that you you got what you needed out of it. That really, as, as a fan, that means more to me than even how much I enjoyed the music. Say hello to the boys in the band. I absolutely will do that. You take care, my friend, and, uh, and keep reading those posts because people will be loving this absolutely until the end of time. Thank you. God bless.